Hi, Peter Lindemann here. It is uh, September 10th. We're basically uh, six months in to what is anything but a typical cyclical recession. This is in no way a cyclical recession. It's a recession that reflects the after effects of, of um, the government's decision to shut things down right or wrong, and uh, what they aren't letting us do now, right or wrong, that can be state, local, or federal governments. Um, and even if they let us do things, what are we unwilling to do for ourselves? So for example, until about three weeks ago in Philadelphia, I was not allowed to go to my gym. That was the government not allowing me to do it. And then it took me three weeks to decide to go to the gym because I wanted to see if there were outbreaks that were immediate and big and identifiable associated with gyms. So that's, that's what I mean by what we are not allowed to do and what we won't allow ourselves to do. And those two are going to continue to play themselves out um, during this recovery. And those are not the typical things that cause a downturn, and they're not the typical phenomena during a typical recovery. So do not confuse this with a typical uh, cyclical downturn that will follow the pattern of a cyclical upturn. Quite the opposite. And in fact, I've come to describe this as the butterfly recovery. Think of a butterfly. Um, it moves, it moves forward, but it may loop back, it may go backwards, it may stop, it may go left or right or up or down. And that's what I expect to see. Um, I, it, it's, it's a butterfly flying uphill. So it is going uphill. That is its trajectory. It's, but it's doing it in a very irregular pattern. So don't be surprised at the butterfly stopping. You're going to see data get better. You're going to see data get worse. You're going to see data get a lot better. Then you're going to see data not do anything. Um, that's the way to think about this. And it's simply because the butterfly is reacting to the environment of what we're not allowed to do, what we won't want, what we are unwilling to do, and on top of that, the carnage that's left in the wake because once a business is gone, even if it's now time to bring people back to work, there's nobody to bring them back to work. So it's a very complex situation. It's going to take time. We have had GDP fall by about um, 10% in this calendar year. Um, that's, you know, that's, we're, we're talking almost $2.3 trillion down from where we were at the start of the year on an annualized rate. We appear to have hit bottom somewhere late May, very early June, as things began opening up across the country, some places still quite shut down. Again, take Philadelphia as an example. You were only allowed yesterday to go inside a restaurant uh, to eat. And I know other parts of the country that's been the case for some time. So expect a butterfly recovery. The official unemployment rate is 8.4%. There's no way that's the unemployment rate that's comparable to where we were at at the end of February. At the end of February, we were at 3.5%. And by any analysis I can do, um, adjusting for people who have not entered the labor force, because what's the point? For people who have retired, figuring what's the point? For firms that have just gone out of business, kind of putting something in for some of the sampling issues that arise in the employment data and the unemployment data, I come up with we're probably around 15% unemployment on an apples-to-apples -apples basis with us being at 3.5 percent unemployment um, at the end of February. Um, it's not that anybody's lying about the data. It's just there are problems. 
it's directionally correct, but specifically wrong. It was never designed for these type of movements and circumstances and issues. Um, so, and by the way, remember that in 2009, the unemployment rate was 10.3%, and it feels a lot worse. We Travel, leisure, and entertainment are basically at zero. If you go back to 2009, there were still concerts, there were still ball games you could go to. Those people were working, um, and and Disney was still operating, Vegas was still operating. So it it is a very hampered economy. And just think of universities and schools that are closed. What about the janitors? What about the you know et cetera et cetera people? So it's a very handicapped economy still. Um, and, and will be for some time. I think it'll be at best late 2021, and that's even with some medical help, because even if we had a strong vaccine, even if we had um, uh, good treatments, it, it's still going to take time for us to trust them, to believe in them, to get back to our lives. Um, and it could well be into 2022 and even spill over to 2023, particularly in travel, leisure, and entertainment, where I think some medical assistance, scientific assistance, is really essential uh, to get rid of the I don't want to do it even though I can. Um, so we're down. The, the, the image I used also, in addition to the butterfly, is imagine... We were at a $21.5 trillion economy. We dug downward uh, this really deep hole of $2.6 trillion to the bottom. And now we're filling it up, but we're filling it up by the shovel full. Just imagine a bunch of people shoveling back in as opposed to bulldozers. And even bulldozers would take some time. So this is going to take a while. Go to the next question. I, you know, I, I, I kind of loosely thought this would be entitled um, 12 questions. So what's the, where are we at? What's the trajectory? Those are two questions. Third is, um, does the election matter? And the answer is, of course. And the problem is there's no way to answer it because there's this infinite combination of do the Democrats win everything? Do the Republicans hold some things? If so, what do they hold? Do they hold the White House? Do they hold the Senate? Uh, you still have two months to go to the election, which is a lifetime. Um, uh, anything could still happen. And then you also have this phenomena of, gee, will the election be contested in courts? Will there be riots if Trump wins? Will there be riots if Biden wins? I don't know the answers to any of those things. I know that if I knew the answers to all those things, I could give a reasonable answer. So for the moment, I think the only answer I can give is, yes, the election will matter, but in very subtle ways along the lines I'm saying. Um, it doesn't, it's not as simple as, it's not as simple as does Biden win because if Biden wins and there are riots, it's very different than if Biden wins and there are no riots. It's not as simple as if Trump wins and there's no riots is one answer. If Trump wins and there's riots is a very different answer. And we'll know the answers to some of these things in two to three months. So that's as much as I'd like to say about that question of will the election matter. Next question is um, what what's happening to cap rates and asset values in general. And the stock market has been very volatile, although, as you know, it's up in a, in a big sense, it's up. Um, and people say, well, how can it be up given all the uncertainty in the economy and the weakness in the economy? And the thing I remind you is asset prices are forward looking. When you do your underwriting, whether as a stock investor or as a real estate investor, you're forward looking. And most of what you're looking at is not the next six months. What you're looking at is the next 10 years, or in even a more theoretical sense, a perpetuity. Namely, what can you sell it at at some point? What I think people are reacting to on asset values is what my research has shown. 
um, if you follow Linneman Letter over the years, one of the things we found, and it's going to be another piece in the new Linneman Letter coming out shortly, is that real estate asset prices respond not to interest rates, this or that. They respond to the flow of capital. If you have a lot of capital flow, asset prices hold and go up. And if you have a lot of capital withdrawal, the asset price goes down. Well, in 2008, 9, 10, the Fed put tremendous amount of money in the system. And over the subsequent decade, it did not come out in the form of inflation of goods and service prices. It came out in the form of asset price inflations. So if you go back and you look versus, say, 2009, early 9, you didn't have much consumer price inflation in the subsequent 10, 11 years, but you had a lot of asset price inflation. That's because the money chased assets rather than goods and services. We've had the money supply increase by about 25% in six months, not 25% on an annualized basis, 25% in six months. And unfathomable amount of reserves have been put in the banks and reserve requirements have been eliminated for banks. And what I think the market's doing is saying, yep, things are going to get better eventually in the economy and uh, cash flows will eventually recover, uh, some sooner, some later. The ones that are sooner, their values are up more. The ones that are later, uh, the values are kind of down. But in any case, there's going to be so much money coming out that it's going to push up asset prices, that banks are going to put out a lot of debt, not just for real estate, for everything. And investors are going to put out a lot of money. And that's why I think the market is where it's at in a big picture sense. I never understand the market in a small sense. That I have no idea. But I do think that asset prices generally go upward over the next year and, and, and certainly over the next three years. Asset prices go upward because there's so much money in the system that's going to chase a relatively fixed set of cash streams, a relatively fixed set of assets, and you just have a lot more money, and I don't think it's going to chase goods and services so much. As a result, cap rates are probably going to go down, if anything, as greed replaces fear, and there still is a lot of fear. Remember, the stock market's where it's at in spite of a lot of fear in the system. And you can imagine what happens if fear recedes. If it can do these levels when fear is still there, imagine what happens when fear recedes. So the same would be true on real estate prices, cap rates to the extent they're meaningful metrics right now, not very meaningful for a hotel and so forth. But um, uh, I think pricing stay solid, though there can be a volatility in that. and There can be noise. I wouldn't want to be in the market with uh, trying to sell an asset uh, around election time when people are worried, are there going to be riots and this and that and so forth post-election. So I'm not saying it's a, a, a mono, just a upward, upward. But I think the general path is upward on asset prices. There's just too much money out there. Question, next question I get asked a lot is, well, won't there be great opportunities um, to buy assets? And the answer is maybe. And, and you say, well, there's so much distress out there. Yep, there's a lot of distress, but there's a lot of forbearance. And there's forbearance at two levels. Think of an office building. Um, you not only are getting forbearance as the property borrower if you need it, but a lot of your tenants are getting forbearance from the banks. The Fed has put tremendous amount of reserves in. They put a tremendous amount of money in, and they basically told banks, use it to keep people alive. Don't foreclose on them. Don't foreclose on them, whether it's a corporation or real estate. As a result, if they forbear and forbear and forbear and forbear and forbear, you won't have great opportunities. They'll stop forbearing only on bad borrowers. They'll 
but if you're a good borrower, if you're a quality borrower, they'll forbear. And you say, how long? The only thing I'd say is Japan has done forbearance for 28 years. And with a very low interest rate, it's not hard to set a borrowing rate such that you can cover um, your debt. And if you can't cover your debt at a 1%, 2% interest rate as a borrower, you have to wonder about the business. Now, forbearance in the short term is wonderful, has very little cost and a lot of benefit. The benefit is it keeps strong businesses that should survive alive, and it keeps strong owners in control of their assets, even though temporarily they've got a problem. And in that sense, it's a good. However, over time, every day that goes by, it becomes less good. Why? And this is the problem of Japan and some degree France and Germany, which is you keep alive borrowers that shouldn't be kept alive. It's very hard to distinguish that one should go out of business. And day to day, that's nothing. But now imagine 10 years. If 10 years from now, the only people who have money are the same ones that got money in 2019, it means we have not allocated enough money to the companies that should have gotten it as new firms, as growing firms in the intervening decade. And that's what's happened in Japan, is they've kept the firms that had the money alive at the cost of not giving some of that money to new and exciting firms that could have been financed and come along. So in the long term, it's a drag on growth. In the short term, it's a good thing. And it's like food, right? Eating food is a good thing, otherwise you die. But eating too much food for too long is not a good thing. So that's the forbearance. If you think about it, you've seen some CMBS distress happening, and you've seen companies, not real estate companies, think of your tenants, companies that were financed with bonds rather than just bank debt, having to go into Chapter 11. And the reason is because it's hard for a bond to forbear. You have to that's what you have to go into bankruptcy for, to negotiate. You have to go to Chapter 11 to see if you'll get forbearance, to see if you'll get a restructuring. If you're a bond, you've got to have that, and you don't quite know what happens in that process. If it's a bank in the current environment, they're going to whine and they're going to say they don't want to and they don't have to but they understand they've been given money to forbear. So there may not be great opportunities. Um, the best opportunities will be in the bond-related world and also situations where negative operating income is occurring because it's one thing to forbear as a lender and it's another thing to step into negative operating losses while somebody else still owns the business. So, for example, full-service hotels are going to have some negative operating losses. And I may forbear, but I'm not going to fund your losses, or at least I don't want to. So that's complicated. But I, I think it's very possible you don't see so many great opportunities, even though there's great distress. Um, let me do a real quick on property categories questions. How is single family doing so strong? Well, if you go back to my March 24th uh, podcast, I thought it was going to get decimated because without jobs or confidence or down payment, people weren't going to buy homes. Well, what happened was the people who kept their jobs or even if they lost their jobs, went on unemployment and were making more unemployed than employed had nothing to spend their money on. So the savings rate rose basically sixfold um, over the last six months. Now, to put that in context, the savings rate is about 33% over the last six months. Just, I'm going to do real simple math. You're making $100,000 as a household. 
it means that in six months, you've saved half of 33,000. You've saved 16,000 over the last um, six months. Um, think of that 16,000 for a moment. That would have otherwise taken you about six more years to save. Not six more months, six more years to save. And by the way, if you look forward, it's likely that in the next six months, you're going to save another five, ten, fifteen thousand. 15,000. Suddenly, people that had jobs and felt comfortable that they were going to keep their job, confident enough, had a down payment. Because this was happening to them, it was happening to their parents. Now, where did that savings come from? That savings came from the canceled vacation, the refund of your uh, air travel, the refund of your basketball tickets, the refund of your concert or theater, the fact that you weren't going out to restaurants. That's the involuntary savings. And you say, well, not everybody makes 100000 No, but enough people do to have spurred the single-family market, particularly in the suburbs. And what you've had happen is people who thought they were going to buy in the next three to five years, because that's how long it was going to take them to build up their down payment, build it up in six months. And you're going to have more who are going to build it up over the next three to six months. And down payment is critical. You say, well, it's the interest rates, not the interest rates, because if I don't have the down payment, the interest rates are irrelevant. And what the involuntary savings did was instantly get people to where they could put a down payment down and, in so doing, take advantage of the low interest rates. But it is much more about the involuntary savings triggering it. Um, what's that mean for apartments? What it means for apartments is apartments are going to get hit by two phenomena over the near term. One is in a high unemployment rate economy, um, you get people doubling up and you'll see your occupancy drift down, not skyrocket, not, not plunge, but drift down. You're already starting to see some signs of that. You see it more in slow lease-ups of finished products than, and then people moving out so much. But people are going to stay at home. The other variant of that is I graduated from high school or college. I would have gotten a job. I would have gotten an apartment. I'm not even looking for a job because it's hopeless. I'm just staying at home. So anybody who leaves your apartments, you don't have that backfill from the recent graduates. Um, so that's a burden. It's not that it's going to happen overnight, but it is a drain. It's hard historically for multifamily to do spectacular um, when unemployment is high. Uh, and I don't think this is an exception. The suburban apartments are going to do better because, again, some of the renters in the city that were going to leave in the next three years decided to leave now. What's the point of being in the city? Is it because I like the riots? Is it because I like the fact that I can only stay in my apartment? I like the fact I can't go to restaurants or concerts or museums or whatever. Um, so you're seeing a move to the suburbs, which is helping suburban apartments, hurting city apartments in the near term. And I, But I think it's not going to be as dramatic as it first seems. Imagine that every year, over the next three years, you were going to have 100 people move into the city and 100 move out of the city in each of the next three years. That would have been zero net change. I'm just taking this as example numbers to make it very transparent. Now imagine everybody was going to leave this year leaves. Well, that's 100. Everybody who's going to leave next year leaves. That's an additional 100. Everybody who's going to leave three, uh, two more years from now leaves now. That's 300 leaving now. And I only have 100 coming in. So that's a net 200 loss. And you say, oh, bye, everybody's leaving the city. No one is ever going to live in the city. They're all going to the suburbs. Well, what happens next year? Next year, I get 100 moved to the city. But the 100 who are going to leave have already left. So what you'll see is actually record moving into the city net. 
of 100, and the subsequent year 100. Now again, I'm just doing these for numerical demonstration purposes. Well, it is possible the 100 becomes 98, or it's possible the 100 becomes 102, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the concept of you're going to get a false signal that the suburbs are stronger secularly as opposed to a time shift. Um, but it will be a difficult next year to probably three, four years in the city. Um, their mayors have generally not comported themselves that well. And um, things are dark in the cities these days. And while the arc of history is pro-city, um, there can be dark periods in that positive arc. It's like uh, the, my, foot, my favorite basketball team wins the game. That's the arc of history. But there are moments when they fall behind, and they even could fall behind by double digits. That's kind of how I see the city. The city's going to win the game or certainly going to win the series. Um, uh, I don't think it's a win-lose. I think both the city and the suburbs can win at the same time. But um, you could actually have cities lose the next couple of years and the suburbs win big. But that's how the single family and apartments, I, I, I see them. Um, what about office? Will no one ever return to office? Probably nationally somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of people are going into the office. Um, uh, it's still very low. This is, we're allowed to, but we won't let ourselves. Um, it will rise, probably like my health club example, it will rise as it becomes clear people aren't dying in mass because they're coming in. They're not getting horribly sick in mass coming in because there's enough precautions and safety. But it's going to be slow. Um, interestingly, while the modern open space office layout that tenants put in in 2017, 18, 19, early 20, aren't going to work anymore because they're too compacted, it's irrelevant. They don't need more space right now because nobody's coming into the office. Eventually, they're going to have to take on more space for their employees, but not until their employees actually start coming back. Um, so... Yes, they're coming back. People are not going to work at home. I was doing a webinar about six weeks ago. It was too funny. And I was pointing out why people aren't going to, aren't going to work remotely forever. And, and in essence, it's real simple. Um, you can maintain uh, a good company uh, remotely for a month, maybe even a year. But you could have never built a good company remotely. You need that energy. And eventually people are going to want to grow, not just maintain. They're going to want to be together. They're going to be creative. We're social beings. So I make this point, which I believe, and they turn it over to another speaker who starts off by saying, well, I think he's completely wrong. People are not going to come back because technology. And then um, his Zoom froze. And for about six minutes, he was off the call. And I laughed and I said, well, I think that just proved my point. Um, technology is good, but come on, it's not the same as being together. People will recover. Office demand will recover. It's going to take time, though. It's the, especially if you have to, in cities where you have to deal with subways, mass transit, and especially as vertical transmission becomes a bigger issue like uh, central city office buildings, it, it is a challenge. Um, is retail dead? I don't think so. It's making some recovery. The business model of restaurants is seriously challenged if you're only allowed to have 10 to 20, excuse me, 25 to 50 percent occupancy. That's a tough business model uh, for restaurants. Um, stores are going to do okay. You're, but people have to be all comfortable going out and shopping. They're showing rebounds. Um, groceries 
have shown that the dominant way is to shop in person. Shopping online for groceries may sound good, but they lose a fortune doing it. And ultimately, it can't be done profitably, so it won't be done effectively. Uh, there will be some retailers who are gone. The thing I remind people of is the history of retail over the last 150 years is dramatic changes. And, you know, P Penny's was in the news today with Brookfield and Simon striking a deal to purchase the remnants of Penny. When I'm a kid, Penny's is a beast. I mean, they're a massive, massively successful retailer. And now they're limping along on desk door. And that's not unusual. That is the history of retail. And um, the disruption of retail is always the case. And I encourage those of you in the retail business to think of it less as retailers than a location where people want to come together and gather and collect and interact and, and, and pick up items is a better description. And if you have locations that service people that way, you'll do fine. If you don't, you're not going to do fine. How about warehouse? Is warehouse immune from all of this? Two points. One, if retail suffers, yes, you may have Amazon, but somebody has the J.C. Penney warehouse or the retailer that went out of business, Henry Bendel. Somebody had Henry Bendel's stuff being stored in their warehouse. So, yes, the strong stuff is doing fine, but don't lose sight of the fact not everybody has that. Um, the second thing about warehouse is if unemployment is higher than 10% for real, um, people just buy less. And if they buy less, there's less to handle and ship and store and so forth. And yes, every time an online occurs, they use about three times as much space as the traditional. So that's an offset. But it's going to feel weakness when you've got such weakness in the economy because people are just not going to do as much. Uh, last thing, last question, is uh, uh, are hotels dead? No, hotels aren't dead, but they're going to be the last thing to recover. And the reason they'll be the last thing to recover is travel, leisure, and entertainment is a lot of personal interface. It's being affected both by what government will allow us to do, how they'll allow us to do it, and what we'll allow ourselves to do. And I think that will be the last boundary. I think uh, particularly as it relates to anything that's international in its focus, anything that's full service in its focus will have a, a relatively hard time. I think you probably are looking out maybe... 2023, maybe even into 24 for certain product types. Um, it depends a lot on medical. If you could take death off the table, if you could take being violently ill off the table, I think you'll see travel return within six to eight months after that. That is once people are convinced it's off the table. But until then, what's the point? I can... I, I can wait another month for my vacation. I can wait another six months until we see what happens. With that, let me um, thank you for your listening. Um, those of you interested in le in, in a little bit letter, uh, feel free to reach out to my brother Doug at dlineman at linemanassociates.com. Um, we think it's a terrific publication. We've done it for over 21 years. Um, we try to do the best we can to give you all the information and data. Um, some of you may, for your younger people or your children even in some cases, um, we have a product that is a terrific online real estate course that ends up in certification called Refia. You can also inquire with my brother about that. And if we can help you 
uh, some uh, in any other way, or if you would uh, interested in uh, us speaking or being in an, uh, an advisory service engagement, please feel free to reach out to us. Stay safe, and um, it's a pleasure. Thank you.